Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. This is Haley Southworth with the Ohio AAP, and I have the privilege of welcoming you to today's webinar and getting us started. Thanks again for your time today. We will be uh, continuing to admit others, and we'll go through a couple of housekeeping announcements before I turn it over to our moderator and speakers. So again, this is an exciting opportunity for us to share with you on early childhood literacy with many, many partners today. As a reminder for CME disclosure, no faculty of this educational activity have disclosed any relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies. Some housekeeping reminders. Please make sure that you are muted and stay muted until the end of the presentation. The slides and a recording of today's session will be posted on our website following. Participants will receive an email with information to receive your CME and MOC part two credit following this presentation. If you have questions during the content today, please post those into the chat box. We will have opportunity at the end of our presentation to discuss those questions. And also our chat moderator will attempt to answer any questions that are housekeeping, operational, or um, otherwise available for us to answer live during the presentation. With that, I'm excited to introduce you to our moderator who will then take it from here and share with you about the rest of our panel of experts. Da Dr. Tabitha Jones McKnight is Assistant Medical Director of the Ohio Department of Health and will be uh, taking over for us as moderator for the rest of our presentation. So thanks so much, Dr. Jones McKnight for all of your work and getting uh, our group together here today and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Haley, and welcome to everyone um, who's joined the Early Childhood Literacy Webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today as we close out National Family Literacy Month. We're delighted to have our esteemed panelists with us today. And during today's webinar, we will hear from Dr. Melissa Weber Mayer, Chief of Literacy at the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce. Next, Marty Martinez serves as, as the CEO for Reach Out and Read, and will discuss this program's role in literacy after which we will hear from Catherine Selecki, Director of Marketing, representing Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. Last but not least, pediatrician Dr. Gregory Zumlis and Literacy Coordinator Christy Hyde, both of Cincinnati Children's Hospital, will share a combined Reach Out and Read and Imagination Library program on kindergarten readiness. We will hear directly from each of our speakers participating in today's webinar, immediately following this special message from Ohio's governor, Governor Mike DeWine. Welcome, and thanks for taking the time to be here. Thank you so very much for the important work you do each and every day to make sure Ohio children are healthy. I'm very grateful for your dedication and your passion. I know that your profession has long recognized that health includes not just physical well being, but also mental and social health. Some of you have included screenings in your practices to help identify and provide resources to kids and families who need housing, food, and financial help. And many of you have seen the great impact of placing a book into the hands of a child. We want every Ohio child to enter kindergarten with a good, strong start. Reading, math, and social skills all have their foundations in the birth to pre-K years. We need to improve on the fact that more than half of all children entering kindergarten are just not on track in language nor in literacy. While progress is being made since the COVID-19 pandemic, only 60% of our third grade students are proficient readers today. We are making in Ohio a big effort to improve literacy achievement at every level by promoting evidence-based literacy instruction. Giving children early access to books makes a big difference. Today, you'll learn about the research. You'll learn about the program, such as Reach Out and Read and Dolly Parton's Imagination Library of Ohio, which gives free books to Ohio kids under the age of five every single month. As physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants, your trusted experts for families. 
what you say really matters and your impact has a lifetime of positive influence. Thanks in advance for engaging your families about literacy. Ohio truly is the heart of it all. And that includes the heart of leaders like you who are making your community stronger and healthier. One child, one family at a time. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Weber Mayer with the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce, lucky enough to lead the literacy work for the state of Ohio. So this includes literacy policies that are in place, plus literacy implementation. And I'm going to give you an overview of, of the work that the department has uh, been focusing on, working with the governor's office on, and aligning everything from birth through grade 12. So uh, we'll start with the, the next slide. Oh, that just tells us who we are, Department of Education and Workforce, here we go. Uh, so we, I like to start presentations with some data. So every year the department is required to provide the governor with an annual K-4 literacy report. Within this report, we, uh, re we um, talk about the percentage and number of students in Ohio from kindergarten through grade four who are on track for reading at grade level or not on track and then proficient at grades three and four. So on track, meaning that they are, they are on track to be reading at a kindergarten level when they're in kindergarten, on track in first grade, second grade, third grade, um, so on. What you see here is, and the governor alluded to this in his video, that 60% of Ohio's third graders are, are reading on track or reading proficiently, if you look across over to the proficient at grade three. And that's about 75,000 students in Ohio. We also have to remember this doesn't include all of our students. Um, homeschooled students aren't included in here, as well as some of our um, parochial school students, et cetera. But then we also wanna look at the number of students who are off track. And so we always put the number of students next to the percentages because it, it, it reminds us of our why. So even when we look at not on track, 40% in kindergarten, it looks pretty consistent, 40%, 38, 45, 44, and then proficient at third grade, 40, fourth grade, 38. We're, talk we're talking roughly about 50,000 students uh, in grades kindergarten through grade four. So 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, where we have about 300,000 students not reading on track. So this isn't to share to um, make everybody sad. This is to share to say, this is, this is our why. This is the importance of focusing on literacy starting early in birth and moving all the way and providing that support all the way through their academic careers um, re until and even through proficiency. So the next slide then shows you, oh, I think we missed a slide. Can you go back one maybe? Uh-oh. All right, well, okay, we're missing a slide here, but go, go ahead and go forward. We have, um, oh, our state has a plan to raise literacy achievement. This plan is a birth through grade 12 plan. We are currently revising it to be birth through higher ed. We have some partnerships with institutes of higher education. Um, and along with our plan, we have implementation guides. So we'll make sure that you get a link to both Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement and the implementation guides. Um, we have a guide specific for the birth through school age entry and questions to think about. These are, uh, these are resources for um, districts to use, but also they're, they're pretty easily accessible for um, offices like yours and groups like yours to talk with, they have kind of guided questions in there. So we'll make sure we get you those. So when we think about emergent literacy, we think about um, a continuum that runs across the bottom here that you see from emergent literacy to adolescent literacy. We also work from a framework that's called the simple view of reading. That simple view of reading is not so simple when you think about all of the discrete skills that need to be mastered in order to be a proficient reader. So when we think about the slide that showed our proficient readers, 
all 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 everything that a child or um, a, a person needs to know in order to be a proficient reader. And then also, what are the best ways to teach and support those skills? So on the slide here, you see emergent literacy. You see uh, an equation. The important part of this equation is that multiplication sign in the middle. The multiplication sign is super important because we need to have both in order to be a proficient reader, to have that true reading comprehension. If we had a one under word recognition, which means we're really good at at decoding words and a zero under language comprehension, but we have trouble processing oral language, then we're gonna have a zero. We're not going to be a proficient reader. Conversely, if we had a zero, we were not good decoders, but we're very good language comprehenders as far as listening, retelling stories, et cetera. We would still have a zero because, because we don't, we're not mastering both, um, both skills. If we were kind of good at word recognition, kind of good at language comprehension, so let's say a 0.25 at each, or 0.5 at each, we would equal a 0.25, still not proficient. So we're looking at emergent literacy skills. And so these are, these are babies on through school age entry. We are really talking about three important components. One is phonological processing. The other is print awareness. Those fall, both fall under the word recognition, which help with decoding. Um, later in life. And then language comprehension is that oral language, oral language skill. So how many words do we speak? How many words do we understand, et cetera? The next slide um, should get into a little bit more. Oh, there's your slide about highest plan to raise literacy achievement. So there are links there that will give you, um, take you directly to Ohio's plan there on the left. And on the right, there are two, there's a link that will take you to documents to support that birth through school age. Those are those implementation guides that I was just mentioning. Okay. So emergent literacy here uh, shows that um, when we think about those three skills, so again, it's phonological processing, print awareness, and then oral language. The evidence shows that these skills um, support infant and toddlers. And um, really we can have focused focused in, um, instruction, but also just focus support in these three areas in order to be um, to make a difference as we as we move forward in our in uh, traditional school settings. So also we need to make a note though that one area is will not necessarily promote development in others. So we can't just focus on one, say phonological awareness and not focus on the other two. All three are important across those preschool years and can start as early as babies. And then uh, the evidence suggests that focus exposure and instruction in all of those areas can be successful in promoting future reading success. So if we think about um, back mapping, uh, doing a back map, map of infant, infant skills, when we think about phonological awareness, so if you go from the bottom of this table to the top, we see some of these discrete skills from manipulating the smallest units of sound, phonemes, which is the most advanced to rhyming, which would be the easiest up at the top. So we start from easiest with two years, two, two and three year olds, all the way down to six and seven year olds. So this is where when you hear people talk and say words around the science of reading, it's explicit and systematic teaching intentional um, in, 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 in kind of these orders. So you're building from bigger sounds to very small discrete sounds. So that's the phonological awareness component. The next slide then gives a little bit of information about the print knowledge, the four dimensions of print knowledge. So when we look at these, we have book and print organization, print meeting, letters, and words. So print and or print organization would be the page order, the title, top and bottom of the book, print direction from left to right, who is the author, who's the illustrator, book cover, et cetera. Second would be when we, when we talk about um, print meaning, we're talking about how whether or not a child understands that print carries meaning, that print has a function, that print is different from pictures. When we think about letters, we're talking about letters, names of letters, the idea that letters are what words are made of, and that there are letters that are uppercase and letters that are lowercase. And then when we get to words, we are talking about how letters make up words. So what is a word in print? Um, we could say, show me a word, point to a book, show me a word, um, show me a letter in a word, et cetera. 
So these four dimensions of knowledge collectively lay important foundations for later, later literacy achievement in both reading and in spelling. And then the, the other part, the other piece that's over under oral language, or, oh, sorry, give you a little, little data here on why we focus on print knowledge prior to school, um, is uh, think about if this group of, I think there's about 80 some folks on here, if you are all four-year-olds and half of you know zero letters and half of you know about 15 letters, then as a researcher, what I would do is I, wanna, I would want to follow you for four years until grade three when we're thinking about education policy in Ohio. So the Ohio State University just did a study like this, and they followed 1,000 four-year-old four children, um, and then they later tested their reading achievement in third grade. And the students who knew 15 letters proved this was proved in more than 50 studies to be better readers in grade three. So it, it doesn't mean that we can, we can or should pull any child and just drill 15 letters over and over and over again, and therefore they will become better readers later. We need to think about that the way that kids know their letters because of a print rich environment um, are the ones who will succeed in late, later in life. So those children that know 15 letters on average are, are a little different or well, maybe a lot different from kids who knew zero letters because they probably have more exposure and a lot of print around them, a lot of experiences with print, et cetera. And we heard the governor talk about Dolly Parton Imagination Library. And we're gonna hear from Catherine in a little bit about the importance of having print around, um, but it's not, superficial exposures to letters only. That's important to remember and to think about communicating. Okay, the next slide shows um, a little bit of a, a, just a quote around word poverty and, um, and the language gap around our children entering our kindergarten classrooms across Ohio with huge discrepancies um, between oral language development and the gap between those language advanced children and language delayed uh, grows further in elementary. So our kindergarten teachers are working extra hard to bolster the language skills, the oral language skills within the children that are entering into their kindergarten classrooms. The next slide gets into a little bit of the language structures when we think about restricted speech that children may be exposed to or elaborated speech that children may be exposed to. So on the left here, we see restricted would be very brief, kind of unelaborated, assumes their shared understanding um, and situational backgrounds. Um, it's used more in homes and often in homes with, with lower, uh, lower SES, lower education. And then if a parent wants a child to move, it's, it's minimal words. So it's, it's move, Jimmy, or move, Melissa, or come, um, as opposed to more elaborated speech where, kind of like what I'm doing, <laughs> what I'm doing right now, where you're using lots of words, lots of descriptions, giving lots of examples, and using um, explicit content based on the situations that you're in. So, and there's an example at the bottom here, Parent want, if a parent wants a child to move or caregiver, Jimmy, will you please move over so your sister can see the television better? It's more elaborated, kind of gives reasons why you are, you are asking the child to move. So these, piece, these pieces that I just went through that are, that are in the early, early emergent uh, years of children are aligned to Ohio's early learning development standards. These standards were rewritten um, to align uh, not only with Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement that I mentioned earlier, but also they were written to align to the, the uh, goal to the strategies under the science of reading. And I will define the science of reading as a plethora of research over 50 years of research of what um, just what what those skills are, which you see in that simple in that simple view, broken down that a, a person needs to know in order to be a proficient reader. I'm going to walk you through real real uh, real quickly then what it looks like going from emergent to early to convent to conventional to adolescent. So the next slide shows that simple view of reading again, but you will see more skills under word recognition. At language comprehension, you still see oral language. So think about early literacy as still preschool and moving into kindergarten. But then we see under word recognition more than just phonological awareness and print knowledge. 
We're seeing more of the alphabet knowledge and sounds that go with the alphabet letters. We're seeing rapid automatic naming, and that could be letters. It also could be colors. It could be other things. And then writing letters or writing names, and then those concepts of print and the print knowledge again, but still a, a, a focus on oral language development. But it's a little heavier, more time spent on those word recognition skills. If we move to the next slide, which gets into conventional literacy, which is moving into kindergarten through grade through grade five, we see some shifts in some of these discrete skills here. Under word recognition, you're still seeing phonological awareness and phonemic awareness, you're, but now you're starting to see decoding, you're seeing phonics and advanced phonics. So building on multisyllabic words, um, building on longer, uh, when we get over in language comprehension, longer sentence structures, when we see language structures. On the left side, still word recognition, sight word recognition. So how many words do, do we recognize automatic? So we're talking about automaticity here and then fluency. Fluency, not just in speed of reading, but fluency and accuracy in reading. And then at our language comp, we see more. So we, before we saw oral language and building oral language, now we're, we're really focusing on building background knowledge and building vocabulary. Those language structures again with longer sentences, verbal reasoning, and then what, and then and different types of literacy knowledge. So that that moves us into basically like a birth through grade uh, grade five realm. And when we think about those skills, this slide just shows the the changing emphasis. So it's not about balance. It's not about a scale of balancing both sides of the simple view of reading equation. It's actually about uh, making shifts and emphasis on the amount of time or amount of exposure to certain skills. So everything that's in dark blue here going across would be more emphasis on those skills during these kind of um, developmental years that you see here. But what we need to recognize is that based on that data, the first slide that, that I share with you, we have children moving across the continuum. So we could have a fifth grader that still needs blending and segmenting support, that may still need some basic phonics support. We may also have a kindergarten or first grade that may be ready for multisyllabic words. So how do we how do we make sure we're supporting um, parents and thinking about questions they even just ask um, their teachers at school? So the, the last slide that I wanna share with you then it just takes us into the adolescent years. So it moved you to that simple view of reading equation again, the multiplication sign stays there, but shows the shift now where now the heavier emphasis is on the language comprehension because we want to, we want to make sure that children have that strong foundation in those earlier grades where they are mastering those foundational skills. So now we're still seeing word recognition being supported under advanced word study. So think about your, we have, we have everybody here is in the medical field, your, your Greek and Latin roots, your affixes here, um, your very long multisyllabic words, your academic language, academic content, uh, vocabulary here. And then are we, be, are we fluent with reading those words, but also are we fluent in understanding? Um, what those words mean. So now you see the heavier, heavier emphasis there. So that is your quick, quick, quick elevator speech overview of Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement. All of this is in section four of that document. So if you want to go back and, and review and open the document um, or share it or talk about it with your staff, section four will dig into these, these components even a, a little more deeper um, than I have here this morning or I guess it's this afternoon. <laughs> so I think that is my last slide. And yep, now it's time for Marty. Uh, thank you, uh, Melissa, for that. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. I appreciate um, the AAP chapter here in Ohio hosting this and for everyone taking the time to be here. Um, I will say before I get started, as I was watching Melissa's presentation as a father of a kindergartner, I was <laughs> intrigued to learn and, and see the scope of, of what's there and uh, reminded every day when, when I read to my son um, where he is and, and sort of his, um, 
you know, I, I, I realized just this week I can no longer spell in front of him thinking I'm saying something he doesn't know. So that's one of my new learnings that I will just share with all of you um, as a father of a five-year-old. Um, but a little bit about Reach Out and Read and, and, and kind of give you some information here um, so that you have more information. On the next slide, uh, I will go to the next slide. Reach Out and Read, we work to give young ch uh, children a foundation for success by incorporating books into pediatric care and encouraging families to read aloud together. Um, and we are not only integrating early literacy into well child visits, but helping to create moments that matter between um, clinicians and children, but also parents and children and doing that uh, through books all across the country and especially in Ohio. I uh, wanna thank some of our Ohio friends that are also here with us from Reach Out and Read. Um, Lori Legender from Reach Out and Read Ohio here uh, from Toledo, Lynn Foran, from Reach Out and Read in Greater Cleveland, and the many clinicians that are on here that are likely Reach Out and Read clinicians. Thank you for what you all do each and every day to help us reach this overall, overall mission. On the next slide, I um, want to show you a little bit of our reach. We serve over 4 million, 4.4 million children across the country. We give out, that number is just updated, 8 million books annually are given out to children under five. We partner around 36,000 medical providers across the country, and we have 6,300 program sites nationwide with over, I think, 1,600 sites in Ohio alone. Um, next slide, you know, we really are trying to create opportunities uh, to leverage the positive effects of daily shared reading and engaging and, and helping to ensure that children can engage in other language rich activities uh, for young children to promote healthy brain development, language acquisition and positive parent child um, experiences. We really are supporting families and young children through uh, a public health framework, which is to reach all children that offers universal and individualized promotion of safe, stable, and nurturing relationships as a standard of care and as a part of well-child visits um, through the promotion of our model. Um, on the next slide, you'll see for us, we're integrated into well-child visits. And I'm gonna walk through that model itself here in, in just a second. Um, but we, what we're attempting to do is ensure that all children have access, not only to books, but have access to uh, a guidance and modeling from a, from a clinician to parents on how to integrate books uh, for children at, at birth all the way to the age of five. We're doing that to help strengthen and support the relationship um, that's being built, um, but also doing that by connecting with community assets and the larger ecosystem, much of which is, is needed uh, to actually do some of the things that Melissa laid out in that framework. So a little bit about our model on the next slide, you'll see at routine health checkups from infancy through five years of age, we reach out and retrain doctors and nurse practitioners uh, it can be pediatricians, family doctors, nurse practitioners, anyone who sees children for well child visits. Um, we are we train clinicians to talk with parents about the benefits of reading aloud and engaging with young children, using a book as part of those visits and that children get and to take home with them. Our model provides 14 new books for a child that's aligned with all the well child visits um, that a child attends. We encourage and, and show parents how to look at books and talk about the stories with infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Um, if you've ever read to a child, you know that it's not always about the words on the book as much as it is about encouraging an opportunity for us to read together at home. I know as a dad of a five-year-old, I've been a, a fire truck, a dinosaur, <laughs> all kinds of different things. It's about connecting around the language in the book, but also moments that allow us to build relationships together and to be able to make um, of that connection. During the exam, providers use the book for developmental surveillance um, and observing how a child and caregiver interact with the book. Um, and it allows us an opportunity to engage all children through their well child visits um, through that model. Children are automatically enrolled in Reach Out and Read. They do not need to register by attending a well child visit with a trained clinician. They are automatically connected to our program. On the next slide, what I will give you a sense of that. So you see, um, it's really important for us that you know we do everything we can to ensure that we are connecting with parents and families at the forefront to ensure there's access to our model. So we seek everything we, we can to ensure that there's access to our model, regardless of, 
um, whether or not a clinic can afford their books. Uh, we partner with clinics, with clinicians and partners to create access to books. Um, so much of reading and learning to read is really connected to having access to books. You're gonna hear obviously two programs here that do that. And it's incredibly important to us that we do that with books that are inclusive of diverse backgrounds, um, including bilingual books in 20, 26 different languages and stories and images and characters that reflect and affirm the diverse range of identities allowing children to see themselves um, in, the, in, in the books and in the world around them. So I thought there's no better way than uh, to show you just a quick glimpse. Um, and I'm gonna show you about a minute of this video here in this next slide uh, of what does it actually look like um, in a visit. This is a clip uh, from a training video for clinicians. And I'm just gonna show you about the first minute of this video so you can get a sense of that. Hey you, what's going on? How are you? Yes. So he's smiling now. He's in, hey, so you see how he reacts to my voice? He's responding to my voice. So they love to do a little table tennis. I talk, he talks, I talk. I'm sure he's babbling with you now. Are you screaming and yelling? And they love the 4 a.m. chatter. Aha. Uh -huh. You're just up and playing. So it's really important at this age that we're just talking and engaging with them as much as possible. Right. Lots of conversation is really going to be the best way for them to develop. So it's not only, yeah, what? Tell me. He has a lot to tell. I see. <laughs> and you know daddy's voice. So you see how he turns to you? Yeah. So he's been yes. hearing that voice since he's been in mommy's belly. And one day, before you know it, he'll be answering back. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <I'm not. laughs> oh, you do. He's not talking to everybody. Uh-huh. And do you guys sing with him as well? Sing, read at night. Oh, you like to read? That's good. I have a brand new book for you here, man. Cody, check it out. Oh, wow. So we love the colors. Look at him reaching for it. Excellent. So at this age, they really love to touch. Gonna go right in the mouth. So it's all about touching and feeling. You see him responding to the colors. Hey. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's not only hands and feet that go in the mouth, it's everything else as well. Look at that. And we love to look at baby faces, isn't it you? Yes. What's she doing? Is she taking a bath? Yeah, so you can name common items that are around the house, but you can also make up stories. So it's not really so much about the words in the book, it's the conversation that he's having with you. Yes. Oh, you like to brush your teeth? Very good. So we'll we'll yeah, we'll stop, like the, we'll stop the video there. Um, of course, it's hard to follow, uh, you know, an adorable child uh, and, and uh, see the imagery of our model there, but wanted to be able to share with everyone an example. This is part of a training video um, to show how you integrate a book for our clinicians who get trained on how to integrate our model. And of course, how to do this. This is a uh, two, I think a three month or two month old uh, visit. Uh, uh, and again, our reality is we begin at birth and go all the way to five years of age and integrate that book across um, our entire visits. And so wanted to show you just a glimpse of that, um, of that model. And in the last few slides here, I want to make sure to show you where we're at briefly. Our outcomes are evidence-based. So of course, um, you know, we're an evidence-based model. Parents are two and a half times more likely to read to their children being exposed to our model. Children's language ability approves with increased exposure. Um, families are two and a half times more likely to report reading together and children's language development is improved by three to six months. As a early literacy program endorsed by the AAP, our evidence base is strong and it shows that parents that are exposed to our model are more likely to bring that uh, culture of literacy into the home, which is an important element to helping prepare and support children. So we're gonna move around three slides forward because I wanna tell you and give you some information um, about what is happening specifically in Ohio. Um, on the next slide, I want you to get a sense that we're continuing to grow and strengthen our footprint in Ohio, working with local partners to build even greater support uh, for what we're doing. And on the next slide, you'll already see some of that, uh, that reach across the state. 337,000 well-child visits uh, in, 
in a year in Ohio, over 270,000 new books distributed annually. We have 1,200 trained medical providers and about uh, close to 200 program sites in the state. And we also partner in the larger ecosystem. On the next slide, you'll see we're partnering with efforts around early childhood, for example, with uh, pre 4 CLE uh, in Cleveland. On the next slide, you'll see we have information there related to trying to connect children that are getting reach out and read with quality preschool options. We partner with DPIL, which you're gonna hear more about um, in Cincinnati and other places um, to make dual connection between what's happening in the clinic and our evidence-based model and the work of DPIL. And we do a lot of work with library systems as well, uh, including in Toledo where we co-brand bookmarks and staff and clinic rating rooms have tote bags and resources to connect library sign up. So again, for Reach Out and Read, we try to tie into the larger ecosystem that's working in early literacy and to do that in Ohio as we do across the, across the country. Last two slides are just quotes from local clinicians that are doing important work. Um, Dr. DiGiulio, which is in this next slide, I like this quote that says, I've seen a change in how parents want to read the book with their child while they're in the office. Kids who have been getting books as soon as I walk in the room, if I have a book for them, more families report they're going to the library. I think Dr. DiGiulio is on this webinar. Thank you for your work. Um, but again, we see clinicians each day talk about uh, their connection to the model and what it does. And last but not least, from Neighborhood Pediatrics on the next slide, Dr. La uh, Dr. Ladder. The act of gifting a book helps children at ease, making them more comfortable in our office and establishing a positive association with the doctor's office from an early age. So for us at Reach Out and Read, we really are about strengthening the opportunity for children to have early literacy connected uh, to this pediatric well-child visit. Um, and to do that in combination with a trusted uh, a resource, a trusted guide for parents, a clinician, it really does allow us to strengthen that engagement and it allows us to continue to uh, strengthen our evidence, which is that children and families take home their learnings and are developing an even stronger love of reading as they work to prepare and strengthen uh, kindergarten readiness and the relationships being built. So I'll stop there and I know there's questions in the chat and I'll try to answer them as well others. Uh, but again, we're excited to be able to continue to grow and strengthen our reach uh, to build more uh, safe and stable and nurturing relationships all across Ohio. So I'll stop there and thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Catherine and I work for Dolly Parton's Imagination Library of Ohio. We are a book gifting program that is available to every child under the age of five in Ohio. And since 2019, the program was established here for the state and, you know, it's grown into, you know, a rather large and beloved program by you know, thousands of families across the state. Um, if we could hop to the next slide. So the way our program works is kids who enroll on our website will then receive one book in the mail every single month until they turn five years old. So you can sign up as young as, you know, a newborn on the day that a child's born. They can sign up and begin to receive that age appropriate book in the mail each month. When there's newborns enrolled, they receive those board books that have, you know, pictures, less, less text on it. And then like in this photo here, you know, two and three year olds receive books that have more language related to the photos on the page. And, you know, it begins to match the child's age. So all of the books are mailed to the child's home, to their mailbox each month, and the books are no cost to all families. We have a local partner in each county who helps to cover the cost of 50% of the books, and our statewide program matches that other 50% thanks to funding from the Ohio General Assembly, and that ensures the program's available to any and all kids under the age of five in Ohio. If we could move to the next slide. 
um, Dr. Zumlaus, who is my partner with the Imagination Library down in Hamilton County. I know he's going to talk a little bit about the scientific impact of the program, but I wanted to highlight a couple of, you know, the impacts that we hear from families who are signed up and receiving the books. So one of our studies that was completed up in Cuyahoga County showed that families were reading these books and using it, you know, as a bonding time more regularly. Their child was being at, was asking to be read to more often and using the language that was in those books in real life. So, you know, a lot of our research has shown that there is a huge impact on having these books in the home and the impact that it's making on the child of helping to expand their vocabulary and the understanding of the world around them. So briefly how our program works, we have the statewide program, which is the team that I'm a part of, where we work with local partners in all 88 counties. And our local partners are 501c3 organizations who help to financially support the program, but then also who manage the day-to-day -day aspects of the program. So they're the ones who are going to First Friday events, community events, partnering with local childcare centers and public libraries to help increase the word about the program and to, you know, make families within the community aware of what's going on. So we have so many incredible partners across the state. We work with 69 amazing local nonprofits. Um, I mentioned down in Hamilton County, Cincinnati Children's is our local partner there. In Shelby County, the Shelby County Libraries is our local partner. And Another example in uh, Medina County, the United Way of Medina and Summit Counties is our local partner. So we do have a wide range of local partners that, you know, are working with us to help increase access to books within their community and, you know, make sure families in their community know that this program is available at no cost to them. So the next slide shows a quick highlight just of our enrollment overall across the state. So currently this month, over 393,000 kids will receive a book in the mail. And this map here shows the percentage of eligible kids who are currently enrolled. So those eligible kids is anyone between birth and age five. So in uh, Cuyahoga County, 58% of those kids between zero to age five are currently signed up. But there's still a really large amount of kids who are not a part of the program for whatever reason. So we are constantly looking for new partnerships and looking for new ways to make more families aware of the program. Even though we're very close to 60% enrolled statewide, there is still a good 40% of kids who don't know about the program and who are not receiving these free books each month. So our enrollment is a very simple process. Our website, there is a button right there on the home page to enroll and caregivers can complete that enrollment process within five minutes. The only information that's needed is the child's name, child's home address, their birthday, and then the parent's contact information. And after that, in a couple weeks, they'll begin to receive their first book in the mail. I know my camera is very small, but I thought I'd show you just what the book looks like. So it comes wrapped in plastic, you know, for the child to see. And there is a label on the back of the book that has the child's name on it and is shipped directly to their home. So I know that my boss's kids receive these books and they get so excited when you know, they see that this book is personalized to them and not their sibling. So they're really, you know, excited and proud and eager to be reading these books when they receive it in the mail. So on the next slide, just to give you a quick visual of some of the, you know, marketing materials that we do have available, there is, you know, a wide range of resources that if anyone would like to have them after this call, I would be more than happy to provide it. 
Um, you know, you just never know where you're going to get catch a kid in a family who hasn't been aware of the program. So we are so excited and so appreciative of the opportunity to partner with, you know, so many different leaders across the state and helping to, you know, make sure that kids are entering kindergarten ready and that they're starting their life off prepared for success. So that was the quick of it. Um, I know there, I just saw a couple questions in the chat, so I will respond to those. Um, now that I'm done talking, thank you so much for your time. So excited to be here and please don't hesitate to reach out if there's any questions or comments. Thanks so much. Hello, everybody. This is Greg Schumloss um, here from Cincinnati Children's. Uh, just to share some highlights of our publication, a combined reach out and read imagination library program on kindergarten readiness. And can we have the next slide? And also on the call is Christy High, our great program coordinator, who will have a, a few comments at the end. But you've already heard about these two great programs. And here in Cincinnati, we're just really lucky to have had a strong reach out and read program for over 25 years. And in 2015, before the statewide Imagination Library program was founded, we're, we're really thrilled to have the opportunity to bring the Imagination Library to our city. And so what we did was pilot a unique combined reach out and read in Dolly Parton's Imagination Library program that was intended to reach at-risk children, integrating, integrating Reach Out and Read's repeated guidance on book sharing with the Imagination Library's robust home library. And our objective was to investigate the effect on this program on kindergarten readiness. Have the next slide, please. And so our program was administered through the existing Reach Out and Read structure in Cincinnati. At 23 participating clinics, Reach Out and Read continued to operate according to established model, providing literacy anticipatory guidance at well visits to an at-risk preschool population. For this pilot, enrollment in Dolly Parton's Imagination Library was added to the Reach Out and Read visit for those children living in our, school, in our city school district. For our measure, we used the Kindergarten Readiness Assessment, or KRA, which is a standardized state test administered to all children at kindergarten entry attending a public school. For our purposes, we analyzed the on-track rate of the literacy subtest. Next slide. We, initial, we initiated the combined program in July of 2015 and analyzed the KRA literacy scores of participants entering kindergarten in the school years of 2015, 16, I mean, excuse me, 2016, 17, and 18. Over 10,000 children participated in the program with 3,247 eligible for kindergarten over the three-year pilot. Next slide. When we analyzed our data, we will, were able to match KRA scores to 25% of our program participants eligible for kindergarten. Here we illustrate the percent of children on track on the KRA literacy for program participants. Can I get a click? In the orange here. And also the entire school district as comparison. Another click. Here in the green. For program participants, can we click again? You see that the percent of students on track in literacy improves significantly by cohort, increasing by 15.4 percentage points between cohorts one and three. Another click. While the school district only increased by 3.8%. When compared to the school district averages, the on track percentages for the entire district were consistently higher than those of program participants. However, the gap was smaller for each subsequent cohort. And next slide. So while this was really encouraging, the results of this analysis, like any study, have to be interpreted with limitations in mind. It was a population study, so we couldn't control for other programs promoting kindergarten readiness or preschool ex exposure, although we really know of nothing going on at the time. We can't identify the exact etiology. We don't know if it was more books in the home or more reading, for example. 
And we're also unable to draw conclusions on the exact impact of the individual programs. But, you know, despite the limitations, I think the early study really, that's okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, you know, this early study shows that, you know, these two programs have combined the repeated anticipatory guidance at visits uh, with, with uh, primary care providers and the influx in books at home can make a big difference. We're continuing to follow some of these numbers, although COVID threw a big wrench in things because the test wasn't administered uh, one year. And as we know, um, things really took some, you know, backward steps as far as kindergarten readiness, but we're still looking at this data. Um, you know, and, and here in Cincinnati, we love and feel that both of these programs are critical. And when we uh, work on them, we don't really talk about which one are we going to endorse, endorse or which one are we going to support. It's really about how are we going to make both of these programs thrive in our region. And I believe Christy, uh, who does, is our awesome coordinator, who makes both of these programs work and spends a lot of time in the community, um, and just say a few words about the collaboration that we see going on in our area. Hello, everyone. Yes. So the, the biggest piece of my role is community engagement. So I work tire tirelessly with our partners, promoting both programs as an equal ent ent entity and just informing the community about both programs, explaining them clearly and how they both um, prepare kids for kindergarten readiness. I also manage um, a coalition of healthcare sites that have both programs and they both really focus on the medical piece and then the work that take, takes place at home with Imagination Library and the free books. And I work with um, enrollment uh, with both programs and answering any questions that anyone has out in the community. So it's a big task, but the importance is just that both programs have the same goal overall. We thank you for your time today. Thank you so much to each of our panelists for your words today and sharing a little bit about what it is that you all do every day to support our children here in Ohio. We hope that each of you has been um, able to utilize the, will be able to utilize the information that was shared with you today as a catalyst for thinking about new ways to engage with children and families in your practices around literacy. Um, there are a few questions in the chat here. Um, and I think one of them was just answered. So um, the one question I had was for Cincinnati Children's Hospital, knowing some of the constraints that clinicians and office staff are under, what tips would you have for a busy practice that may be contemplating implementing programs like these, but may have reservations about how to actually introduce this within the workflow of their office? I think like with a lot of things, once you, um adopt the program and take it under your wing, you'll find that it's really easy to integrate. Um, at our visits, you know, we do reach out and read. We talk about reading. We try to model. We give a book and we make sure they're signed up for the Imagination Library. And, you know, I know there's so many things to talk about. We talk about shots. We talk about growth. We talk about safety, car safety, gun safety. And it's like everything. You just, after a while, learn how to weave it into your practice. And, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, while I examine the child and they're looking at the book, we we talk about some things. So, you know, in the it's a lot. We all have so much to talk about. But I think over time, you just really learn to weave it into your into your visit, and it really doesn't take much time at all. And again, it's just like the repeated kind of doses, even if it's small. If you don't get to spend a huge time, you know, modeling at this visit, you know, you might be able to on the other visit. So it's just that tiny dose of reading at every visit that I think is really important. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Zoomless. And there was another question in the chat with regards to um, any availability of books for and what's available for children and families with hearing loss or vision loss. And I believe, um, Catherine, if you want to take that question. Yeah, of course. So there are both audio and Braille books available through the Imagination Library. The uh, nationwide Imagination Library program has partnered with organizations who help to print those and make those available. So there is a separate application process for that. 
And that is something that just because of the technical nature of it is managed, you know, a different way. So if you are interested in signing someone up for that or, you know, learning more about it, we do have information on our website. It is just not the, you know, traditional enrollment button. Great. Thank you. And to follow that question, someone did ask about whether or not there was um, any Spanish enrollment forms for the local health department that they could be able to utilize and provide to um, participants in their county. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have Spanish and we have, I believe, five other languages as well. So I am happy to send that out to whoever is appropriate to mass distribute, or if there's, you know, an email address that someone would like to pass along in the chat, I am happy to forward that over. Great. So we do have an additional question. Someone posed, is there a postcard or paper with information on it that could be handed out? Um, this individual works in the schools and would love to pass out some of the to pass out to some of the students if available. Yeah, we have a ton of marketing material, so happy to, you know, forward a couple of those along. And I know that um, AAP created something here that I'm not going to explain, but <laughs> I know that was made specific here too. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much to each of our panelists for today. That does conclude the end of our Q&A. Questions that were not able to be addressed today will be answered in the FAQ posted with the webinar at a later point in time. I'd like to again thank each of our esteemed panelists for today. And thank you also to the Ohio American Academy of Pediatrics for co-hosting this webinar. Again, I will turn it back over to Ohio AAP for final announcements. Thanks so much uh, to Dr. Jones McKnight and to all of our presenters for taking the time to share today. I know I learned so many things I can use with our practices and projects and just really appreciate the time that you've taken to learn with us as well. As you can see, we did uh, pop up briefly to share a resource that was created to go along with this webinar. There is a QR code on the screen as well as a link that will be included in your follow-up email to a rack card that was designed with information on why reading during early childhood is important and connections to many of the partners we heard from today. As another reminder, we are hosting an additional webinar coming up in just about two weeks, focusing on brush book bed, which is another early literacy and sleep routine focused program that the National AAP developed, and we're really excited to be able to share information from one of Ohio AAP's experts on how Brushbook Bed can be an opportunity to build relational health and um, has some great long-lasting protective value. The link will again be emailed, and there's a QR code on your screen right now. I'll pause for just a moment in case you need to scan that, uh, but hope you might consider joining us on December 13th for another webinar. And finally, just a, a final thank you to everyone for your time today. Again, we will be sending an email with CME information for claiming. Any other questions that come in, we are happy to send answers via email, and we will post the recording of this webinar for you to reference and share if there are others who might benefit. Once again, thanks for your time and have a great rest of your afternoon.